Let's worship together, shall we? Washed in the blood. Let's all stand. Worship. Thank God for the blood. Amen. Jesus for the blood of dead. <clears throat> Ready? <clears throat> You've been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? soul cleansing blood of land are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the land and the bridegroom come and fill your robes be white are you washed in the blood of the land will your soul be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the land are you washed are you washed in the blood, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed, are you washed in, the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed, are you washed in, the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. And 
take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Bathe in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Amazing grace, thou always be my song of praise, for it was grace. Striving cease, 
my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain And bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost its grip on me For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of Jesus, 
we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the morning and see Christ the lion away. What a glorious dawn, fear of death is gone, for we carry his life in our veins. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens. Our King will return for His own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout. For glory to Jesus alone. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. All right. Well, like I say, it's good to see everyone. Missed you all. It's a good thing we're used to social distancing living in Wyoming, right? Otherwise, it would have drove us completely balmy by now. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Ezekiel chapter 11. And we're going to look at the new birth is what we're going to look at. Um, we've been following a particular theme. I don't know if you're aware of that, but we've been looking at a particular theme and Last week, I looked at man's complete inability to respond to God on his own, apart from God's grace, getting a hold of him. And this is why, because of our condition, we must be made new creations. We must be turned into new creatures in Christ. Uh, we must be born again. Uh, the reason why we must be born again is because our human condition by itself won't cut it. It's under God's judgment. It's under God's condemnation because we're in the first Adam and we must be put in the second Adam. Um, we were put in the first Adam by birth. We were born into the first Adam. So all of his traits were passed on to us and all the condemnation that landed on him landed on us. But the good news is there's a second Adam, Jesus Christ. And this is why he said, not optional, you must be born again. Because as you examine your own condition, as you examine your own fallenness, your own human heart, you realize that the testimony given by God through his prophet Jeremiah is correct. Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, I search it, I try it to give to every man. So 
Our hearts must be made new. We must be born again. Nothing of the old man is, a, is accepted by God. We must be born again. Now, this born again statement that Jesus gave to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 in the Gospels, it's not a new idea. It's an idea that's as old as the book itself. Jesus didn't come up with something completely new. Nicodemus, who Jesus was preaching to, had the Old Testament memorized better than I've got it memorized, and yet he missed the spiritual implications of what was already being said because he came to Jesus as a religious man. He came to Jesus as a perfect Pharisee, and that's why Jesus told him, you must be born again. And that befuddled him. Yet, as you turn with me to Ezekiel 11, and verse 19 through 20, you will discover that this is no new teaching that Jesus is giving. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. In fact, what Ezekiel is promising here, Jesus delivers on this promise because he's the bringer of the new birth. He's the bringer of the new creation. He's the bringer of the new covenant. Let's read this. And I will give them one heart. He's talking about a collective group, the people of God, not just one individual here. Notice who it, who it is that's going to do this. Who's speaking here? God. Now, if you said Ezekiel, I'd say, yeah, but who's speaking through Ezekiel? I, Ezekiel can't give them one heart. It's impossible. Have you ever tried to get a group of people together to agree on anything? Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, because that's the only place where you'll find agreement. Hopefully, <laughs> even then, among professing believers, you don't always find it. But God has promised to do in us what we cannot do in ourselves. He says, I will give them one heart. That's collectively, God's people. So not only does he give you a new heart individually in the new birth, he also gives us collectively a new heart. And it's a heart that wants to obey God. It's a heart that wants to follow God. It's a heart that wants to say yes to God. Not denying that that old, crummy, old creation still isn't trying to gain inroads in your life, right? Still there, isn't it? Just because, you know, I found out real early, just because I was made a new creation didn't mean that sometimes those, <laughs> that old creation, that old guy that was born in Manchester doesn't rear its ugly head. You know, when I came to Rock Springs, Wyoming, I did bring my new creation with me, but that old creation is still wanting to hang on. Oh, but he's not forever. That old creation will disappear one of these days, just like the caterpillar shreds its skin and becomes the butterfly. When Christ returns, we'll shred this old creation completely. But in the meanwhile, may God grant us power by his Holy Spirit to overcome the old creation. Isn't that the battle we're currently in? Because there came a point in my life when I realized, hey, I am a new creation. My life has changed. But then there came a point in my Christian life, it's like, if I'm a Christian, then why am I still doing this? Why am I still thinking this? And then you enter into that confusion that Paul covers in Romans chapter 7 and in Galatians chapter 5, that the flesh was against the Spirit, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. My friend, it's inescapable. Periodically, I meet people who say that they're sinless. I don't know if you've ever met people like that. I'll be honest with you, yep. Yeah, and I'm going to get in trouble for this, but what I'd like to do is the litmus test is slap them and see the response. 
But then I'd be sinning by doing that, you know. So, and I'm sinning for even saying it. So pray for me. Uh, <laughs> wishful thinking, of course, the Bible says. What does the Bible say about a person who says he's without sin? And who does he deceive? He's certainly not deceiving anyone else. <laughs> um, there was a preacher that said on TV, he says, I'm without sin. I'm perfect. Ask my kids. You know what I say? I need God's grace. Ask my kids. They need it as well to put up with my parenting. <laughs> And I will give them one heart and a new spirit. Notice it's a new spirit. It's a spirit that's made new. Why? Because the old spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. It's under God's judgment. It must be made alive by God. In other words, the new life that you and I are called to live as Christians, God is the author of that new life, is the giver of that new life, is the imparter of that new life, and so to God be all the glory as we begin to live out that new life in the new creation reality. I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. Who will put it in you? Jesus, God, same thing. Holy Spirit at work in you to put in you this new creation reality. This is not a work of man, this is a work of God. This is something that you cannot do to yourself. It's something that God must perform in the human heart. We're helpless, we're powerless. We reach that point where we realize that our response to God is nothing but rebellion, nothing but disobedience, nothing but hatred until God changes the human heart. The human heart will not obey God. The human heart will not say yes to God until that heart and that spirit is made new. A new spirit I will put within them, he says. Notice this. What was our condition before salvation? Were we pretty good people, but just kind of led astray? I don't think the Bible covers it that way. I will remove the heart of what? Stone. Can a heart of stone respond to God? The only way it responds to God is in rebellion and disobedience and says no. That's why it must be changed. We cannot serve God from a heart of stone. We cannot expect someone who's not been born again to live for God. They won't live for God. And even if they do the right thing outwardly, their heart ain't in it. Because they have hearts of stone. I have a heart of stone apart from God. Some of you here, if I could rustle up your testimonies, you would say the exact same thing. I have no intention of following God. When people preach to me, I'm like, you can keep that. You can keep that. I don't want to listen. And that's what gives us hope, isn't it? That when we're sharing Christ with others, it's like, you know, you're saying the exact same thing that I used to say. And here I am following Christ. What was it that changed me? You see, our hope isn't that human beings all, all by themselves will just say yes to God. Our hope is, is that God, by his almighty grace, will get a hold of them and turn them upside down and inside out, if need be, to bring them to himself. God knows what it takes to save a soul. Do you believe that? He knows what it takes. For me, it took demonic oppression. <laughs> I hope it doesn't take that for you. Each person is unique. Each person that becomes a child of God is unique on how God prepares that person for salvation and how he brings you to himself. You can look back and you say, wow, God overruled on that one, didn't he? 
He will bring you to your knees where you will know the only option is yes to God. I will remove the heart of stone. Thank God he'll do that. You cannot change your own heart. Your heart is your innermost being. It's who you are. It's not just a physical organ that pumps blood in your body. It's, the, it's your innermost being, your thoughts, your will, your desire, your intent, everything that directs your life. Your heart is like the engine room of your life. If the engine is bad, it doesn't matter how good the body of a car looks. If the engine is shot, that car ain't going anywhere. You can give it a paint job, but it needs a new engine. And that's true about the Christian. That's true about the human being. You, you can give it a paint job. You can have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. But you must be made new. You must be born again. You need a new engine because the old engine is shot. The rod has gone through it. It ain't going anywhere. The only hope for the human heart is that it be changed and made into something new, brand new. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Here's a question. Does a heart of flesh say yes to God? Does a heart of flesh sense God's presence? Is a heart of, God, is a heart of flesh responsive to God? Yes. Where previously a heart of stone did not respond to God in obedience, a heart of flesh will. God has promised in the new birth and in the new creation to give you and I a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh. And a heart of flesh is grieved over the things it used to rejoice in. A heart of flesh is grieved because finally that heart of flesh responds in love to God. We love him, the Bible says, because he first loved us. You did not love God until he first loved you. That's grace. Now notice the reason why he does this, and notice that the evidence of the new creation is a changed life. You will have desires that you never had before. You will have longings for God that you never had before. You will have a love for God that you never had before. You will have a passion and a hunger for his word that you never had before. One of the problems that I encountered when I became a believer was the misunderstanding of people who weren't believers. And they said, you know, Brian, have you read the Bible all the way through? And I said, yeah. He said, well, why do you keep reading it? And it's like, I try to explain that it's the Word of God. It's not like any ordinary book. It's, it's the only book that claims that it's fully inspired by God. There's no error within its pages, you know? It's perfect. And uh, the more you read it, the more it grows on you to the point that you realize, I will never master this book. <laughs> this book masters me. On occasion, you meet people who think, I've mastered the book. Good luck with that. You're just getting started. This will get reversed on you, and this book will master you before we're through. There comes a point when we're not just reading the Bible. The Bible is reading you. When the Bible starts reading you, oh, that becomes somewhat uncomfortable. I think that could be the cause of a lack of serious Bible reading. We don't want to look in the mirror and see ourselves. However, here's another point. We need to read the Bible to see and understand the new creation. As I pointed out to you, there's a double whammy here. There's nothing good in the old creation, but here's a point. In the new creation that God has put in you, you have been created in true righteousness and true holiness. And he has put good in you by his new birth. But it's from the new creation, not the old. Amen? So, I will not even 
understand the new creation at all if I'm not reading this book. Now, I'll be honest with you. In all the years I've read this book, will I ever reach a point where I understand the new creation? No, I'm not. Until I see him face to face. Then I'll finally look at you if we're there together and I'll say, man, if I would have known that God put that in Gordon, I would have treated him a whole lot better than I did. Because we have new creation realities in us that we have no knowledge of that won't be brought forth until we see him face to face. However, we are being transformed and changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And the ignorance of what God's put in us at the new creation really hurts our Christian life now. This is why, one reason why we go back to the old creation, to try and dig for good stuff there in all that rubble, is because we don't understand the new creation. So we go back to the old creation and say, man, there's got to be something good there. I call it a rummage sale. Have you ever been to a rummage sale? I don't find any good items of the rummage sale. Maybe you do. When I first moved here to America and someone took me to a garage sale, my definition of a garage sale is someone selling their trash and other people picking up that person's trash. Just saying. Though I got to be careful, I'm, I'm having a garage sale this summer. So anyway, feel free to attend. Um, but anyway, um, that was my definition of it because I never saw that kind of thing go on in England. And it's like these Americans are odd. But anyway... Um, notice what must take place for us to walk in obedience to God. We must be made new. We must be born again. So notice this next point, verse 20. And notice that it comes after the new birth, not before the new birth. To state the obvious, right? That they may walk in my statutes. The statutes are here in his word, his exhortations, his commands. And keep my rules and obey them. That happens when God gives you a heart of flesh at the new birth. You have a desire now to obey God that wasn't there before. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. Let's go over to e Ezekiel 36. Just in case we missed Ezekiel 11, 19 through 20, Ezekiel brings up the issue again in Ezekiel 36. Now, I must point out Ezekiel's ministry. Ezekiel was um, exhorted by God, you are going to a, to a people with a stiff forehead. They're not going to listen to what you say. How would you like to start out with a ministry from God? This is why I would never want to be a prophet. Because all the prophets, basically, most of them were told that, hey, they're going to go preach to a people that don't want to listen. And they're going to reject what you have to say. But I'm sending you anyway. It's a good thing Ezekiel wasn't pragmatic because God said, if I was going to send you to a people of a foreign tongue, they would hear you. But I'm sending you to the rebellious house of Israel. <laughs> he said, their, heart, their, their foreheads are like flint. They resist me. Their hearts are like stone. But I'm sending you to preach to them. Now, here's a thought. Did Ezekiel get fruit from his ministry? Yes. Because it made the Bible. <laughs> We're preaching what he's saying today. Some, you know, over 2,000 years easily removed, almost 3,000 years removed from when he first spoke. Why? Because the word of God will never pass away. It's eternal in the heavens. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. The psalmist said, 
So when you're going to God's Word, and you're relying on God's Word to get you through, you are relying on something that will never pass away, the Word of God. It will abide forever. Ezekiel 36, let's go there. Ezekiel 36, 25. Let me ask you another question. What kind of, were, were, were um, the people who Ezekiel was preaching to, were they a godly bunch of people? They were pretty godless at this point, weren't they? But let me also point out to you, this is why he's preaching the new birth. The new birth wasn't just preached in the New Testament. It was preached in the Old Testament as well. David in Psalm 51 understood his need for a new birth. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, right? Put within me a spirit that always seeks after you, um, is one way to look at that. But Ezekiel 36, 25 there's some people who look at this and they want to make an ordinance out of it. And there's people who look at this and say, okay, all, all we've got to do is baptize people. Now, I'm all for baptism, aren't you? The Bible commands us to be baptized. But baptism doesn't save. Baptism is never saved. It's to save that get baptized. It's those who have received salvation that get baptized. You don't get baptized, then get regenerated. You get baptized because you've been regenerated. It's a believer's baptism, not an unbeliever's baptism, surely. So here what he's referring to is, I believe he's referring to spiritual washing that's provided by the Spirit of God via the Word of God, the washing of water of the Word. And God is making this promise here in this statement. He says, I will. Notice the I will. I will. God is saying, I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's the real holy water right there. <laughs> the kind that's applied by God himself. Amazing how we as human beings, we want to make ordinances the means of salvation itself when they are the evidence of salvation and they're the picture of something that's already occurred in the person's life. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Notice the effects of this clean water. God himself says, and you shall be clean. Let's face it, these people were in bad shape. God isn't looking at them and saying, I can't clean you. God has hope for them. And God gives hope to them through his prophet Ezekiel via this promise. This is a promise for us as well. You shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. Notice the, plur the plurality of that because of the sorry condition of our state. And then he goes on to say, and from all your idols, I will, I will, notice the I will again, cleanse you. As I pointed out to you, the worker of the regeneration and the worker of the new birth is not you, but God. This is performed by God in you. This is done by God in you. And it's very effective because anything that God does is effective. He doesn't miss the mark. Amen? Man, if we're serving a God who misses the mark, we're in trouble. He's a good shot. He's never missed his target yet. You may have been far from God, but God still hit bullseye on you. I will cleanse you. Notice this next statement. And I will give you a new heart. Basically saying what he said in Ezekiel 11, but with more addition. I will give you a new heart. This is done by grace. Something that's been given is given by grace. I will give you a new heart. I'll give you a brand new engine. One that purrs. I, I'm not familiar with the mechanical 
statements, but you know what I mean. One that's in tune. One that's in tune with me. One that when you rev, you've got power. Amen? <laughs> power that you never had before. His divine power has given us all things. Scripture says in Second Peter that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. That's why we can grow and progress in the faith and begin to put on different virtues and different qualities as we grow in grace. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. This is God's work in you. And I will remove the heart of stone. Notice he's done with the heart of stone. He removes it. He takes it out. And from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. But here's the next part. And this is something that was hinted at in Ezekiel 11, 19 through 20. But now, in Ezekiel 36, 27, we are given the promise of God's Spirit being put within us. I want to point out Ezekiel 11, 19, 20. It says he's going to give us a new spirit. But do you know why he gives you a new spirit? It's because he puts his Holy Spirit in your spirit. Think about that. And he changes the innermost core of your very being. And he sets about that regeneration. He performs that work of regeneration. But my friend, regeneration is just the beginning. But what a beautiful beginning. It's the beginning of the new creation. And, and that new creation is a process that we're in as believers. Where we are called to be changed from glory to glory even under the same image as we're beholding Jesus and worshiping him. That's the beauty. It's sad to me that the church today and many people in the church, even many preachers in the church, are trying to clean up people's old creation. They still think that there's something good in human beings and that we really don't need to be born again. But we're pretty good folks. We're pretty good people. That is not the Bible description of who we are. We may have convinced ourselves that we're nice and good and decent and all of that. But you must be born again because you're, all your decency, all your nicety, all your attempts to please God in your flesh are rejected by God. The first person that tried that was Cain. Remember Cain? Do we want to be from the line of Cain? I hope not. As one singer said, Adam and Eve planted some Cain, and we've been suffering from that ever since. But Ezekiel 36, 27, notice this. I'm taking longer over this message than I had planned. It may require two, two sermons. Somebody said, oh, I wanted you to record for three hours. I know that no one's going to say amen here on that one. Um, and I will put, no, this is doing this, God. This is not something we can do in our own power. It's absurd to think that I can achieve this in my own power. This is something that God has promised. I'm powerless to do this in myself. I, I hope in God, I put my faith in God to do this in me. I can't do this in my own power. It says, and I will put my spirit within you. Isn't that good news? His spirit is in us through the new birth. Not only has he given us a new creation in our own spirit, he has put his Holy Spirit in us to reside in our innermost being. That's awesome to consider. You say, why are you preaching on the new birth? I think it's a neglected subject. I think, that, I think it's possible for people to come to church and say, well, I'm a believer and I'm a Christian and I say yes to all the doctrines of the faith. But my friend, have you been born again? That's important. Spurgeon, in one of his sermons, he even scolds the preachers and he says, hey, 
preacher, if you've not been born again, it's like, it's no good preaching you must be born again to others and you've not been born again yourself. And let me tell you, that does happen. There are preachers preaching you must be born again who aren't even born again themselves. What good is it to give the medicine if we don't take the medicine ourselves? We may be giving medicine out to others and they're receiving it while we ourselves perish in our sins. I will put my spirit within you, notice this, and cause you to walk in my statutes. He will cause you to walk in his statutes and be careful. You will have a diligence about you that you never had before where you want to obey his rules. You want to say yes to God and live in obedience to God because you love God now where you didn't love him before. And now you want to please this God whom you now love. And you love him because he first loved you. This is why you must be born again. Because a person that's not been born again will not love God, cannot love God. They might love a wrong idea of what they think is God, but they're not truly loving God. Not the God of the Bible. Because me and my sin, when I look at the God of the Bible, it terrifies me. And I run from this God. But oh, when he sent his only son into the world so that I might be saved and not condemned, that makes me want to run to him. Titus, let's go over to Titus because what we've been covering in Ezekiel is covered by Titus. Titus, the third chapter. Just go to all the T's. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. I don't know if you realize that, but all the T's are there in that area. <laughs> That's one way of remembering where to find it. Titus, Titus. This is why we got to get the gospel right, because if we don't get the gospel right, we'll have people thinking that they're saved and that they're Christian and they're really not Christian because they haven't yet been born again. They'll be thinking, hey, there's something good in me that responds to God. There's something nice in me that says yes to God. No, it's all condemned. It's all under his judgment. Why? If it wasn't, then you wouldn't have to get born again. <laughs> Titus 3.3, 3, he describes our former life here. And uh, reminds me, I was in a Bible study, and we get a lot of wonderful people come to our Bible study, and I, I love them all. And we're all in different places. And this person came to me and said, Brian, um, and this person had been raised in a church all their life, and this person said to me, Brian, when you talk about the former life, are you talking about reincarnation? <laughs> and I'm like, no. And I got to explain to this person what the old life is that Paul describes. Because some people haven't been on the other side of the fence. You know, they've lived from our human standard pretty good, you know, and been raised in the church. And uh, now this person, I don't think, uh, well, this person has grown beyond that now. But we have to be prepared to answer questions and not make people feel like dummies when they ask it, right? And not look shocked, like, what? Um, because everyone's in a different place. And so I got to explain to this person, no, when Paul describes his former life, he's referring to his life before he was converted, before he was born again. Now, Titus 3.3, 3, it says, For we ourselves, let me ask you a question. Does this describe you? Good. I'm glad someone agrees. Because if you're sharing this and people get upset at this, say, I'm, I'm upset at this because I'm a pretty good person. No, not according to the Bible. It says, for we ourselves were once what? Foolish. And what else? Disobedient. Disobedient to who? God. Led astray. Oh, and here's a big one. Here's a big one. 
This is why the human will will not be free and cannot be free unless God's grace frees it. This is why. This is why God must affect this change in you. This is why God must work that in you by his grace because we were slaves. Is a slave free? To state the obvious, no, a slave is not free. Slaves to what? Various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And it sounds like my existence in Manchester. No wonder why I wanted to move. Oh, but we love the scripture when it says, but, because that changes everything. That's what changes everything. When God moves, change ensues. If God didn't move in your life, you would still be living this awful reality of Titus 3, verse 3. Unless God, by his grace, intervene. It really is by grace that we are saved. It really is. How far do we want to take that? We want to say, yeah, it's by grace, but... No, but it's by grace. And if you can't grab that yet, I pray that you will before we're through with this Christian life because it will make this Christian life harder for you if you don't believe that it's purely by grace because you'll be trying to do this in your own power and it's miserable. You might be doing the right thing outwardly, but your heart then isn't rightly motivated. You see, God is more interested than just our outward action. He wants to get a hold of the motivations of our heart. He's not satisfied with just a nice outer work. He wants that good work to come inside of your heart first before it's ever displayed on the outside. God doesn't just test the outward work. He tests the motivation behind it. That's why we need to let God be the judge because we might look at others and say, what a splendid person. What a splendid work. But let God be the final judge because he alone knows the motivation of the human heart. I'm sure Cain brought a great offering to God and it would have impressed me. But God looks at it and says, it stinks. It's full of your own goodness. And so I reject it. I'm sure he offered his, the, best, the best of his works of the ground. But it was rejected. Oh, but let's tie this 3, 4. But when the goodness... And loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. That's Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. This is what changed everything. This is what brought the promises in Ezekiel that we just read into living reality. This is what made it not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile also. Notice this. Titus is describing the same thing that was described in Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36, Titus 3, 5. Not that I want to go, not, not that I want you to go around with a fruit inspector's hat, but let me ask you this question. Do you think there are people in our churches today who haven't been born again? Now again, I'm not going to be the fruit inspector and put my hat on and begin to assess because... God knows those who are his, not me. Not me. God does. We have to say there's probably people who aren't born again in our churches because we don't preach, you must be born again. We think that people already know this. We take it for granted that people already know this. So we try to go to what people call the more advanced truths of the Bible while rejecting the foundational truths of Scripture. And it's like trying to put a roof on a house before you've even dug the foundation. It might look good for a short time, but it will collapse. 
I love the book of Revelation, wonderful book. We've done two studies on it in the past eight years. But let me warn you, the book of Revelation is put last in the Bible for good reason. It's put last. Do you think, you think God made a mistake by putting the book of Revelation last in the Bible? And he's not saying don't read it. But, oh, I wish people would read Romans first and Galatians first. The book of Revelation gives us hope. It predicts the future. It tells us the finish. It tells us the finality. But the book of Romans tells us what the gospel is. And it tells us about our salvation. And it tells us about imputed righteousness. My friend, if you're going to go to the book of Revelation first, without first being grounded in the book of Romans, you will choke on the content that's in the book of Revelation. It's a guarantee. Now, I don't want you to go away and say, ah, Brian said don't read Revelation. Did I say that? Because one of the things I'm learning here as a preacher is that sometimes I say things and people take it and completely twist it to mean something I didn't even mean. I guess that's part of the territory. Now, um, he saved us. Who saved us? Amen. Did you give him a hand in this? He saved us. There's not two saviors. There's not three saviors. We're not giving Jesus a hand in this. He saved us. And how do we know? Not because of works done by us in righteousness. That's pretty plain, isn't it? That's very plain right there. This is why he did it. Not because of you, not because of something great you did, but according to his own mercy. Oh, that's good. You know what? I want to trust more in the mercy of God than in my own works, in my own goodness. There's another place in Romans where, where uh, Paul says, it's not to him who wills, not to him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. There comes a point when you fall upon Jesus and you realize, God, if you don't save me, I'm not saved. If you don't finish what you've started, I'm lost. I'm relying on you, Jesus. You know, on our deathbed, if we get a deathbed, we're not going to be rehearsing all the great things we've done and say, Lord, let me into your heaven because I've been a pretty good guy. At the end of the day, it's like, Jesus... You died for me on that cross. You rose from the dead for me. I'm trusting in that. And if that doesn't save me at the end of the day, then I am not saved. We trust too much in our own selves and not enough in Jesus. According to his own mercy... And here's this washing, by the washing of regeneration. What is the opposite to regeneration? It begins with D. Degeneration. When Adam, when Adam and Eve fell, do you know what happened? Degeneration set in immediately into the whole human race. His rebellion, his sin was transferred to me. 6,000 years removed. I'm, I'm in that fallen bloodline. And that's why Jesus shed his blood for me, so I could get inside a new bloodline, the blood of Jesus Christ. On a new track, you must be born again. His blood had to be shed because blood had to be shed for sin. A price had to be paid. And oh, what an infinite price was paid for you and me. In all of our legalisms, we belittle the work of Christ. We lessen the work of Christ. We say it's not enough. My friend, if Jesus is not enough, if the cross is not enough, if the blood is not enough, then nothing shall be. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That's talking about being born again, so when you get regenerated, he lifts you out of that degenerating uh, condition and puts you on a new track 
and puts a new nature on the inside of you. And all the potential is there within us to begin to live as, the, as, as Jesus did. But we're in it in imperfect form. We still have this old nature to deal with. Jesus being sinless, Jesus being perfect, Jesus being the Son of God, he never had a sin nature like we had. Oh, but he took your sin to the cross. And he was tempted in your place. And he rose above it in absolute perfection. His perfect righteousness is attributed to you. By me trying to be righteous on my own, I'm rejecting the perfect righteousness that's been granted to me in the gospel. Okay, so it goes on to say, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's been poured out on us, this new birth, this regeneration. I'll share with you my testimony. Our, our experience is secondary to Scripture, and I understand that. Um, but I got this on, on a farm road at the back of my house. I didn't know that such a thing was even possible. I didn't go to church. I was reading the Bible because I was demonically oppressed. I didn't know God. I'm trying to repent. I couldn't repent. I'm trying to reform my life. I couldn't reform my life. I was powerless. This is why I believe that repentance is a gift from God. This is why I believe God grants repentance. Because until um, that farm road situation where the love of God was poured out abundantly in my heart, I did not repent. I could not repent until God gave me the ability to repent. I tried to. I couldn't. Why? Can I be truthful? I didn't really want to. I just wanted God to lift me out of the hole I was in. But the problem with that is, lift me out of the hole I'm in, God, but you know what? I'm still the same person, still the same sinner. I'll go back and do the exact same things I did before, and guess what? You'll have to dig me out of that hole again. You must be born again. I didn't know what being born again was. So I got born again. And when he put new life in me, oh, for the first time I read my Bible because I wanted to. For the first time I repented because I wanted to. For the first time I wasn't just grieved over my sin because of what it brought in my life. I was grieved over my sin because I sinned against the one who loved me at my worst. That did not happen before. But that happened after. Now, I got a few quotes here. Can I preach on a little bit? I've only preached for 50 minutes. I got 10 more minutes, right? Okay. No one's fallen asleep yet. If you have, you've mastered the art of sleeping with your eyes open. But anyway, um, I, I just want to give a few quotes here. Do we know what repentance is? Do we really know what repentance is? Repentance is a change, is it not? It's a change of mind. Repentance is a turning to God and a turning from your sin. It involves that, right? Let me ask you a question. Can a person do that all by themselves? Here's, here's a problem. If we believe a human being can do this all by themselves without God's grace working it in us as well, we don't really know the true understanding of what repentance really is. Nor do we understand the true nature of the human heart prior to God's grace effecting his work upon it. I'll quote, I'll, I'll, I'll quote a southerner here, Dabney, um, by southerner, not English southerner, American southerner. He, he said, but let anyone look at the scriptural definition of repentance and he will be convinced that none but a regenerate heart is competent to the exercise of My friend, God command. What you, now, you might ask the question, if we can't repent on our own, why does God command it? Well, here's the point. God gives us many commands in the Bible, the Ten Commandments. Can you keep the Ten Commandments? But God still commands it. The reason why God commands repentance, even though you can't repent on your own, is to show you your true condition and show you your need of Him. He'll show you the right way but then 
He'll give you the fuel to meet the right way. So this is why we can preach God commands men everywhere to repent. And the moment you begin to see and you try to repent, you realize, I can't do this on my own. I need help. I can't even repent without your help, God. Help me. By grace, you are saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I titled this sermon this morning, um, Human Response, the Fruits of God's Divine Work. A person who is under the effects of God's conviction and God's Holy Spirit operation will respond to God where previously he would not have responded to God before. And I'll try and finish this sermon in one breath, but um, it goes on to say here in this quote, um, the true penitent not only feels the danger of his sins and the involuntary sting of a conscience, which he would disarm if he could, but an ingenious sorrow for the sinfulness of his sin and a sincere desire for godliness My friend, an unconverted person isn't going to have a sincere desire for godliness. It's not there until the new birth kicks in. Can anyone feel this but the regenerate soul? Can he who hates God thus grieve for having wounded his holy law? Think about that. Can he who loves sin as the native food of his soul thus loathe it for its own sake? No one feels godly sorrow, but he who is passed from death unto life. And I believe that to be the case. You must be born again. All our works are wood, hay, and stubble unless you are born again. You must be born again. Your old creation has been condemned. The good news is it was nailed with Jesus on that cross. So when I look at, yes, I'm condemned, there comes a point, if you read the book of Romans, (laughs) where you see my old man was crucified with Christ at that cross. This is why Romans, in the progressive order of the books in the Bible, is put before the book of Revelation. Because finally, if I get grounded in Romans, if if I get grounded in Galatians and in all the other parts of the Bible, and then I go to Revelation, it's not going to mess me up. It's put last for good reason. Read it. Study it out. Follow some of the studies we did online and examine what we say and check it out with a word for yourself because at the end of the day, don't just believe it because I said it's true. Be a Berean. Be a researcher. And uh, check out these things and examine them for yourself. Because at the end of the day, you'll give account for what you believe. If you go and say, well, Brian said this and Brian taught that, you may rest assured I'll give account for that if I taught you wrongly. But don't put your trust in me. Put your trust in Christ and in his word. Because that would be discipleship gone wrong. Blind leading the blind, potentially. Follow me as I follow Christ, and in the way I don't follow Christ, then please do not follow me at all in that sense. Now, another quote from Dabney. I, again, I, I don't mean to give all these quotes, but I think they're good quotes. I've been doing a lot of study, a lot of research. Too much time on my hands. The sermons might get longer. I'm just saying. My wife said to me, all this time we've had off and I haven't done anything. And I'm thinking, I've done a lot. I've got a lot of books read. and Yeah, I've done some honeydews, but uh, balance, my dear, balance. But anyway. (laughs) If we confound worldly with godly sorrow, let me ask you a question. Judas Iscariot, did he regret betraying Jesus? Did he, but did he truly repent? No, but it's possible for us to have remorse for the bad things we've done to the point that we hang ourselves like Judas. Satan entered his heart 
but there was no true repentance in that man. So it's possible for us to have a sorrow for what we've done, but only because we've been caught and only because of the consequences that now ensue. Not because we genuinely, you know, and even his words, he says, I betrayed an innocent man's blood. And he threw the money back in that he coveted. It's a reminder to us that Satan entered his heart. And the sad thing is, when Satan is done with his instruments, he will destroy him at the end of the day. Reminds me of the old song, you're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Let me tell you, we know who the better master is. Okay, let's read this. We may indeed ascribe true repentance to the unaided workings of the natural heart. But if repentance is understood as above, as what we just previously read, we shall see that while it is a duty for man to exercise, it is our duty, it is still one to which he must be moved by the supernatural grace of God. Do we believe that? Hence, you've only got to look at your own testimony <laughs> to believe this reality, right? When your testimony lines up with Scripture, you're like, wow, I, I can relate to what this, this sovereign is saying, this sovereign guy is saying. I'm glad I don't have his accent coming through. It's good. Hence, the Scriptures always represent it as God's gift or work. Acts 5.31. Let's look at some Scripture. Scripture is the final litmus test, not quotations. We quote teachers in the church, but at the end of the day, we line up their quotations with Scripture. Scripture is the final authority. It doesn't matter what preacher so-and-so says if it doesn't line up with Scripture. Give me Scripture. And if we give quotations, let them line up with Scripture. Amen? Oh, I've missed preaching, obviously. But anyway, um, Acts 5.31, it says, God exalted him, Jesus, at his right hand as leader and savior, notice this, to give what? To give repentance. So if God gives repentance, that makes repentance possible, doesn't it? He gives it. If he didn't give it, it wouldn't be possible. I think that's why, too, sometimes in our own ingenuity, when we seek for repentance for a while and we can't find the ability to repent, I think God reminds us that we need him to be able to do it correctly, um, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So he gives forgiveness of sins and he gives repentance and forgiveness of sins. Acts 11, 18, let's go there. Acts eleven eighteen. Now, you remember the problem in the early church. It was strictly Jewish for its short term. And the Jewish believers got a little upset with Peter, you know, when he went into the house of the Gentiles. And uh, even Peter struggled with it. He said, you know, it's not customary for me being a Jew to go under the roof of a Gentile. And I... He may have finally discovered bacon, but anyway, and the blessings of bacon have been created by God and is meant to be received with thanksgiving. There's my plug for bacon. When they heard these things, the Jews, they fell silent. They heard the testimony, and this is what they did. And they glorified who? God. Let me tell you something. A gospel of grace glorifies God. That not only can he bring salvation to you and me, he can transform a people like you and me. And they glorify God saying, I'll put my own thing on it. Then even to the Gentiles also, God is what? Granted repentance that leads to life. 2 Timothy 2, and I'll probably close with this one. And what I'll do is I'll continue, I'll, I'll continue part two tonight, if anyone's interested, because I've got a lot, too much time on my hands. I've, I've, even, I've even forgotten how long a sermon should be. But anyway, 
I got two sermons here. So tonight I'll give the second version of it. And if you're not able to be here, it will be online. And I may even have Butch video it for the sake of... Uh, for the sake of you getting the whole message. But this will be the last verse I'll look at tonight, this morning, tonight. Is it tonight? It's this morning. See how I'm thrown off with uh, my whole... I even had to remember, it is Sunday this morning, isn't it? Yes. Better get with it. How many of you forgot it was Sunday when you first woke up? Somebody did. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Magnus, for your honesty. One thing you can guarantee our Magnus is he'll, he'll tell you something. If I misquote something, he's one of those kids that will say, no, nope. and you know what? I'm thankful for that because it's the Bible that counts and we correct one another in love with the Bible. 2 Timothy 2, 23, 26. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and this is uh, Paul writing to Timothy. Uh, there are times that I'm in a quandary about what to do in ministry, you know, and what always comes back to me is 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I have brothers and sisters that, that, that remind me, preach the word in season and out of season. Now, now, here's a warning to us, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. The servant of the Lord must not strive. How many of you have found yourself at times breaking the scripture. I raise my hands on that one. Sometimes you feel so passionate about something, you're like, no, and you start, uh, dump, and you realize, oh, fruit of the Spirit. I need the fruit of the Spirit. So, so the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, Correcting his opponents with what? Gentleness. Wow. What is gentleness? Isn't it a fruit of the Spirit? Man, ministry is going to require some self-control. Speaking of something that's mentioned last, you look at the fruit of the Spirit, <laughs> self-control is mentioned last. Might be the last one we finally get a hold of. Not quite, uh, but kind to everyone uh, with gentleness. Now, here's the thing. And this is the beauty of ministering the word is if I think, let, let me just give you a thought. If I think that I have the power to get Gordon to repent, I'll use that as an example, Gordon. Then, boy, I'm going to beat him over the head, aren't I, Gordon? Have I beat you over the head recently? I apologize if I have. If, if I'm trying to do the work in you, <laughs> I've sat on the preaching where it feels like, man, I feel like I've just been hit over my head with a two by four for the whole sermon. And there came a point in sermons I used to attend at some point in my Christian life, I would take aspirin with me or headache tablets with me because I'd go in there feeling good and leave condemned, beat over the head. Well, here's the good news. I can't get you to repent. Only God can. So I preach the word. I can't even get myself to repent all by myself. Now you might say, Brian, I object to what you're teaching. Come to the second part tonight and you'll get the rest of the theme because it is in a sense an incomplete sermon. But the second part will cover more adequately perhaps some of the misgivings you might be having in your mind right now. God may perhaps, no, this is no guarantee. The King James uses the word what? Peradventure. I love that word. I can't help it. God peradventure. Grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. No, this is spiritual bondage. And they may come to their senses. Only God can do that. And escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So, my friend, this work of repentance isn't human beings alone. It's God working it in the human being. The human being will repent. Don't misunderstand me. That's the second part of my sermon that I'll cover tonight. 
the difference between uh, regeneration and conversion. I didn't get to that, but I will get to it tonight. So, the end of the day is, we are dependent on God to work this work of repentance in us. Otherwise, we will not repent. We, will, we are called to seek repentance. We are called to cry out for it. And according to the Bible, if we're crying out for it, if we're wanting it, then God will grant it. Amen? Let's stand and let's pray. Second part will be tonight. Father, we thank you this, this morning for bringing us back together. We do thank you for this glorious gospel that you have given to us. We thank you, Lord, that you reached down in our stubbornness, in our rebellion, in our hearts of stone, and you didn't say, oh, heart of stone, I expect life out of you. You took the heart of stone out, our old nature, who we were before we knew you, and you regenerated us. And in that regeneration, you give us a new heart, a heart of flesh. And you gave us something that we did not have in and of ourselves. And we thank you, Lord, this morning for that. And Father, we pray that if there be anyone here that's not yet born again, we ask that you would touch that heart. We ask that you would begin to deal with that heart. And we ask that you would begin to work on that heart in the way that only you can and that you would convict, you would bring to that point of recognition that they haven't been born again and they must be born again. Father, open our hearts to you. Let our hearts be cut by that word like on the day of Pentecost and let our hearts be exposed and be candidates and be, be wide open for this work of your regeneration. Father, we cry out to you today and thank you for this marvelous gift of repentance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you all.